Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. I am your host today, TJ Van Toll, and with me on the panel, we have Paige Niedringhaus. Hey, everyone. And our special guest today is Gleb Bamutov. Gleb, welcome to React Roundup. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. I'm not sure how special I am. I'm pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you start by, by telling people who you are, uh, what you do, and why you're famous? <laughs> <laughs> or infamous. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm Gleb Bakhmutov. I live in Boston. I've been here for a while. Currently, I work at a company called Mercari US. If you want to sell something you no longer use, it's very simple, very good user experience. Before that, people know me from four years working on the Cypress test runner. So if you write end-to-end, component, unit, API test using Cypress, you're probably using my code, documentation, plugins. Uh, I love writing plugins and open source. Before that, I worked for startups and large companies like MathWorks. But I'm a huge, huge fan of open source work. So I have lots of NPM packages, lots of GitHub repositories, and lots of blog posts. And now I've got into recording YouTube videos. Oh, right? nice. I got myself a professional green screen. So you can find all the little cyber tips on my YouTube channel. <laughs> we'll have to link to that in the show notes for anybody who's interested. <laughs> hey, folks, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And lately I've been working on actually building out Top End Devs. If you're interested, you can go to topendevs.com slash podcast and you can actually hear a little bit more about my story, about why I'm doing what I'm doing with Top End Devs why I changed it from uh, devchat.tv to Top End Devs. But what I really want to get into is that I have decided that I'm going to build the platform that I always wished I had with devchat.tv, and I renamed it to Top End Devs because I want to give you the resources that are going to help you to build the career that you want, right? So whether you want to be an influencer in tech, whether you want to go and just max out your salary and then go live a lifestyle with your family, your friends, or just traveling the world or whatever, I, I want to give you the resources that are going to help you do that. We're going to have career and leadership resources in there, and we're going to be giving you content on a regular basis to help you level up and max out your career. So go check it out at topendevs.com. If you sign up before my birthday, that's December 14th. If you sign up before my birthday, you can get 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. Once again, that's topendev.com. So I know we want to talk about some Cypress features, but why don't we start just, we have some beginners that, that listen to the show. Why don't we start with the absolute basics? Why don't you give like the short version of what is Cypress for people that have never never used it, never even heard of it before? Yeah. So imagine you are a developer and you're writing a piece of code, right? You could be writing a function that adds two numbers. So you write like function add, takes arguments A and B, and gives you A plus B. So you need to make sure that function works. So you feed that function, you call it with arguments, let's say two and three, and you check the result. You expect it to be five. And if it is five, then you know it's working. But imagine you are writing a web application or deploying a website. Well, how would you test that? Well, if you're a human being, you would open your browser, go to the URL. It could be local host, so it could be deployed URL, and you see if a website loads. And then maybe you click on a button and you check if text changes to what you expect it to change. So Cypress is meant to test your website after it has been deployed or running at local host. So it's not testing a piece of a code like a function. Instead, it visits the URL. It checks if URL loads. You can click on buttons. You can find text. You can you know, kind of interact with a page as if a human user would and confirm that it's working as expected. So it's called end-to-end web test runner because it runs your tests. So that's what it is. Yeah, and I've only recently, like the the concept of like an end-to-end tester or runner has been along for quite a while, but I feel like Cypress is one of the, it's at least the most popular tool recently that has made it quite easy to Mm -hmm. do, at least to me, right? Because some of these tools in the past I've used like, Oh God, I've used Selenium in the past. I've used uh, like... Puppeteer. <laughs> yeah, like all of these tools that like I have, I don't know, maybe not the greatest relationship with because <laughs> they're they're powerful, but they can always, always, they can they can be hard to use. Whereas I feel like Cypress has made your life quite a bit easier for writing these sort of tests, at least mm-hmm. from my brief <laughs> forays with it. <laughs> I have to say, that's what was my opinion. I did not write Cypress, right? I joined the company very, very early, and I used it for a while, for a year before I joined the company. When I saw that, 
because I, I, I went through the same journey, you know, Phantom, GS, Casper, all this kind of yeah, bridges yeah. towards the browser. And when I saw Cypress API, I was like, oh, just NPM install, and it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it has time traveling debug. The API makes sense. It has, you know, all the bundle tools that you need. It records the video of a test run. It's, it's just easy. Like, I can concentrate on actually writing the website, and it just runs the test, so I don't have to concentrate on the test part as much. And it just made so much sense. And I do appreciate kind words. It's not the only game in town, obviously, where our testing tools, you know, taking different approaches. I think Cypress takes a nice approach because when it opens a browser, it actually runs the test in the browser itself, right? So all the commands like visit, click, should be visible assertions and so on, they execute in the browser, which has some technological advantages over tools that run, let's say, in Node and just send commands to the browser, to the remote instance, because you don't control the browser as much. And between the commands, your application might be doing something. So for example, if you say, for example, imagine you're testing an email application. The difficulty with end-to-end tests is that you don't know what's happening in the application right? Because it might be written in different framework and so on. So for example, you say, okay, fetch more email, oh, not images, emails. You want to click on that button. Well, if you just load the website, it might be fetching the emails at the startup. So if you say, find the button and click on it, well, in between find the button and click on it, your application might start fetching. And when you try to click, well, the button is disabled, right? By your application. And that's the source of play because, you know, in between the commands, your web app can actually do something else. Cypress, when it runs in the same browser window, actually runs in the same event loop. So if your application wants to disable that button while the test finds it and clicks on it, well, the application cannot because it has to wait for a test code to finish. And when the test code is finished, it knows the button is there, it's enabled, it can, it's clickable, Right. So it kind of removes a large source of this, like hard to debug flake issues. Yeah. That a lot of tools have. And it kind of makes, for example, debugging the test and the application much simpler. So when I saw that, I had the same experience. It makes my life easier. I want to work on it. I want to use it more. And that's why I joined the company, actually. <laughs> awesome. So one question that I had, Gleb, was recently, I think it was maybe in Cypress 9, there was a new experimental feature that was Cypress Studio. Could you talk, did you have a hand in helping to create that code? I did have a hand in it, but trying to prevent it from being created. I was oh. <laughs> I was against it, and I still am against it, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so for our listeners, first of all, that tool has been removed and now it's back, right? Cypress actually removed it in version 10. There was a huge outcry. People (laughs) were like setting themselves on fire, literally. (laughs) In GitHub issues, right? Asking for for this tool to be brought back and it is is back, right? So what it does, imagine you visiting your website in the browser. And when Cypress has this like special button, you click on it and now you can just click in your website you know, find input fields, type, click some more, and it's recording your actions, and then it saves it as Cypress commands back in your test file. Mm-hmm. So that's the Cypress Studio. And this project, I mean, people asking for it, you know, for a while, right? Whereas, you know, other companies that allow you to record your interaction with a website and create a test for it. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of issues that I have with this approach. First, approach is that it's easy to record your actions on a website. You know, click on a button, type on an input, click another button. But it's very hard to actually record meaningful assertions. Like, what do you expect after you click on a button to happen, right? I mean, you as a user, you see a text appear, you're like, yeah, I see the text, fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're recording your action, you have to select text somehow and say, check that this text appears now. And Cypress Studio had a couple of assertions, like you can right-click on an element and say it should be visible after Mm -hmm. you click the button. But it was very clanky. And after you record these actions, like click, text should be visible, another click, you'd have to save that. Like it saves it into the test file for you, but you'd have to go back and adjust it, like Mm kind of edit, right? Make sure you add, insert meaningful assertions, maybe change some commands and so on around to make it actually stable, solid test. Right. And I always felt that 
Cypress is actually watching your test file as you code it. And so it runs the test all the time if you save a file. I always felt that I would actually write a, te- a, a solid test faster in code, just watching it rerun constantly than by recording it and then adjusting it later. Mm. So that was my, you know, first objection. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people disagree. We, we can all kind of, it's fine. It's fine. I, I can see the point that some people can say, oh, I, I can record faster than I code. That's fine. But there is another issue that I always found with this recorded test. It's very hard to update them, right? Mm. Yeah. I, imagine you recorded like 50 tests. And then a button can move, or the text might change, or the flow new user like login changes. You have to re-record those 50 tests, right? It becomes a huge maintenance burden, right? So I'm glad the Cypress Studio is back because users have been asking for it. I, I want everyone to kind of check it out, see what we think, see if it works for them. But, you know, kind of think about long term. Do you want to maintain those tests? Are the tests actually good enough after you record them, or do you have to make a pass over them to make sure they're maintainable in the future? And are the tests actually testing what you think they're testing? Do they have meaningful assertions mm-hmm. about the application's behavior, right? So that Cypress Studio story for me, I was always against it. <laughs> I'm glad that the user find it useful though. Yeah, I mean, I, I've used Cypress Studio when it first came out, and I can agree with you that the the way that you interacted with elements could be extremely, I guess it was very specific. Cypress is trying mm-hmm. to say, I'm clicking this element, but it made it so specific or it, it was that it was not reusable. So I did yeah. find myself either refactoring so that I could use the same thing and just pass in like a different button name or a different element in the browser yeah. and same for assertions. But to me, at least it was kind of like a nice starting point. You know, I, I yeah. at least could go to the page and then I could say, you know, you click on this nav button or you click this footer thing or whatever, and then re kind of rework what Cypress recorded into a more yeah. human readable and friendly manner. But I can see where you're coming from too, where it's just to you, it's just a waste of your time and you'd rather <laughs> just write it out from the start. I wish there was something like Cypress Copilot, you know, similar to GitHub <laughs> Copilot, that takes whatever it yeah. recorded and then like, boom, based on what it learned from good tasks, like adjust it, you know, looks at your application, picks better selectors, adds intelligent assertions, right? Maybe then it would be like so good. People would be like, Gleb, you were right, but <laughs> you also were wrong. And it was okay. <laughs> Man, yeah, no, really I really take over. <laughs> I'm oh, coming yeah. from, pages, from Pages' perspective as well, because not... The biggest thing it did for me, speaking of studio, is just it helped me discover how Cypress sort of works because mm-hmm. I, and this is just becoming from a beginner Cypress user's perspective, but I imagine other people that are new to it would feel similarly, but I can't stare at a test file and they're like, oh crap, well, how am I supposed to find that button and how am I supposed yeah. to click it, right? I don't know the APIs. Yeah. Whereas if I can do the click one, I can see like, oh, get an idea of how the tool is approaching it. Yeah. And then ideally go back and say like, okay, now I know what to do, but I can, the developer in me can say like, okay, well, this tool is doing this, which this is a little bit clunky. And if I change this, it's going to break. So maybe I tweak it a little bit. So it's it's just a nice, I guess, like tool to have in the toolbox and hope you hope that developers just uh, know how to use it, I guess, responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a great point, right? Imagine you are throwing into like new language, new library, new framework, right? How do you build those like initial stepping stones so nobody is frustrated, right? Just like drops their hands, like I'm not going to use it. I don't know. I, don't, I feel stupid using it because I don't know what's happening and just gives you enough information. So you're like, oh, I see how it's working. Okay, it's not too scary. And this is the next step I can like, make it better, add one more command. I know where to find documentation for commands, right? And if I, for example, use command click, but it generates for me, it it leads me to double click and maybe click on the top corner, right, of the element instead of the center. And maybe leads me to, uh, you know, how to check if a button is visible before I click, for example, right? Like all these extra things. Like this is not, it could be a nice pathway, to realistic tests, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It so, reminds me. Oh, go ahead, TJ. <laughs> no, it just re- it reminds me of like UI builders for for yeah. like the web. It's it's like it's a great starting point. Like, does does it produce stuff that's a little bit clunky and hard to maintain? Yeah. Sure, but is it a great tool for develop for beginners to like learn the platform a bit and to yeah. build something like actually useful? 
Yeah, mm-hmm. that too. Yeah. But one thing about testing tools, remember, you have kind of like double audience. You have a developers, right? They're working on, on the web application and testing it. And you also have maybe a quality assurance department that takes a view of like, there's a feature, we need to make sure it works. So they start writing from completely different you know, viewpoint from developers. And the v- developers have a huge advantage. If uh, Cypress Studio gives them a selector to the button that's like really clunky, kind of look like position, subclass, like, re- like really, really unmaintainable. They can change it. They can add a test attribute. They can use ARIA label. Whereas QA, when they come in and they're like, okay, I need a test for this button. They only have to work with what's available, right? Yeah. And, and there's always this like, which kind of audience do you optimize it for? Right? And sometimes it's impossible. So we know that Cypress started out and has done extremely well as an end-to-end testing framework. And I have to say that in more recent versions, one of the cool things when you first install it is all of the example yeah. end-to-end tests that you get. So if you're, like TJ said, if you're new to it, you can tr- see in action all these various yeah. things that you can do with Cypress. But one of the more recent additions, it seems like, is the ability to do unit testing or to do component testing. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that because I've seen that it's a possibility, but I really haven't looked into the specifics of it yet. Thank you, Paige, for bringing it up. I mean, we talked about this before the show, but I'm glad you brought it up. Imagine you are testing a complete website, right? This is what Cypress does. It's end-to-end. You visit the URL and you interact. You have no idea what the framework or implementation details are. But that's not how you actually write the website or web application, right? You're probably working with individual parts in your framework. It could be React, could be Angular, Vue, Svelte. You could have your own homegrown components, right, and framework and libraries. So, for example, let's say you want to make sure that the date picker that you work months on, right, or that you brought from like some Kanda UI or Material UI library, right, but actually works, right, and works for all the different edge cases where like some dates are unavailable. How does that look, right? So it becomes really hard to actually test it through end-to-end tests because you have to control the data, and Cypress can do some of it, and it can control the clock, but it's it's really slow and clunky process to show the date picker and all the different configurations. That's why people use Storybook. They take the component, they pass different props, and they see how the component looks in all the different situations. So maybe four years ago, I had this idea that wouldn't, what's the difference between a component and the web application? Very little, right? You can think of your component running by itself as like mini web application. In most cases, if you have a date picker component, you just need React library, maybe set up some props and put your date picker component at the root of your application. You can literally change your public index HTML to instead of the app to mount just the date picker. And a lot of people, that's how they develop, right? They have this like development index HTML file where they just, whenever they need a component, they just change the text and mount that component and look at that in a browser. And I don't know, React scripts like bundles everything up for them. Okay, great. So why can Cypress do that? So I've written adapters for each framework, including React, where you say, import the component, and then you have mount command, and it literally takes your component, creates like a dummy page for you all behind the scene, and bundles everything up, and starts that React component, like date picker, as a mini web application by itself, okay? And once the web component, or not web, like once your framework component starts running, like date picker, after that, it's a full-fledged web application. You can use any Cypress command, like find the button on a date picker, click on it, check the text is visible or some date is disabled. That's it. So you just have to mount using framework-specific code. And after that, you use just end-to-end test commands. So I've written components for every framework. And it took a while to actually make it a first-class citizen in Cypress. Because you have to think about, you know, how would users actually use that, right? How would you integrate with all different frameworks and bundlers like, you know, Vit and Webpack and whatever people want to use, mm-hmm. right? What the API would be, right? So right now, Cypress has it for React. They had it for a while. They released it for Angular, Svelte, and Vue. And 
I even released a course, Cypress version 10 Fundamentals. It's a free course on Blaze Meta University. We can link it in the show notes where I, I showed a Sudoku game. And I said, okay, this is how you write end-to-end tests. And now let's look at React component test. So one of the components could be a timer, right? That just clicks every second and shows how long you've been solving the Sudoku. So you just mount that component by itself and you check with Cypress commands, but after one second, it shows 0001. After two seconds, zero. so it ticks, right? Another component was like the status, right? Where it shows like the difficulty of a game, the current mode. Another component could be like the numbers that you, you know, select. And think about your entire application. It's actually a tree of components. You kind of create like a footer out of individual components. You create navigation. You create maybe something else. In case of Sudoku, you can think of like the, the root being this big game component. Mm-hmm. And Cypress component testing allows you to mount small components and then bigger components all the way to the game component at the root, right? But you're not visiting the URL, right? You just mount that component. You can pass the props like normally, right? You can pass Cypress spy and stubs, right? And, and when you interact with the component, you can check that what game component actually, for example, changes the provider data correctly as expected. So you, you test that component already with its implementation details a little bit, but not too implementation specific, right? You mm-hmm. still see it running and so on. So super happy. Very little framework specific knowledge is necessary. You know, once you've seen it in React, you can use the same approach in Vue, Angular, right? And you don't have to learn any specific or framework specific tooling, right? You can use React testing library, but instead of using it at like the Jeff level, you would use Cypress testing library with all your Cypress commands that are equivalent, like find by label, find by role, right? So you can transfer. And then you can use the same knowledge if you, for example, have to work with a view application. Mm -hmm. It's literally just a mount command. You know, details might be a little bit different, but the rest of the test is the same. So no more, you know, view testing utils, no more angular test harnesses. (laughs) It's just like universal way to mount something and then go. You understand the rest of the test. It's all the same. So it's out there. Try it out. Let me know how it works for you. Man, Angular test harness brings back some memories, and they're not they're not very good ones. So, <laughs> hi, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and lately I've been coaching some people on starting some podcasts, and in some cases, just taking their career to the next level. You know, whether you're beginner going to intermediate, intermediate going to advanced, whether you're trying to get noticed in the community or go freelance, I've been helping these folks figure out how to get in front of people, how to build relationships and how to build their careers and max out and and just go to the next level. So if you're interested in talking to me and having me help you go to the next level, go to topendevs.com slash coaching. I will give you a one hour free session where we can figure out what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go and figure out what the next steps are. And then from there, we can figure out how to get you to the place you want to go. So once again, that's topendevs.com slash coaching. You know, the funny thing that Cypress component testing for Angular actually wraps around it. So you have all the power if you need to, right? Of test harness and test bed, right? It just, it's hidden for you by default. You just see that component all of a sudden like, boom, appears on the page and it functions and it works, right? But after that, you don't have to like trigger digest cycles. So any framework specific, it's all taken care of for you. You just click on a button, check that something appears or, or network call is made and so on. Yeah, this is, it's sort of fascinating to me because in, it's almost like a different way of approaching the same problem we've been doing forever because it's, in a way, it's very similar to testing library, at least like to me, it's, it sounds very similar, but I suppose, I well, really, I'm kind of curious on the difference because it seems to me the bigger thing is that it's running in an actual yes. browser, yeah. right? So I'm going to guess there's just some benefits to doing that. Like it just feels like, because even like testing library encourages you to think like you're using a browser, but it's, it seems like this would be a step further because you you, you literally are using a browser. Yeah. So you sort of very much have to, co- to to code up your test as the component would be used. Am I, am I thinking of this right? Uh, no, no, you're absolutely correct. So if you think about React testing library and your component, you would actually use Jest, right? So the Jest is the test runner. 
Right. And yeah, it okay. has a JavaScript DOM emulation, just DOM, right, mm-hmm. under the hood. So when you use React Testing Library, it mounts your component inside the synthetic browser environment, but it's nothing like a real browser. It just has like something that looks like API. And then you would use React Testing Library to fire all these like synthetic events, like click, right? And yeah, then check yeah. where something happens, right? Mm-hmm. All, all that goes away with Cypress component testing. It, Cypress starts the browser that it controls, it bundles everything up using your framework of choice, and then it mounts the component and lets the browser actually be the browser. And when, for example, you want to click, you don't have to create synthetic click, right? It clicks using the browser. It, it, it uses either a real click, like a native event, or you know, synthetic, but it doesn't matter. It, it, it's, it's a real thing after a while, right? So you see everything in the browser. It behaves correctly. There's, there's a lot of things that just dumb doesn't give you in terms of API. And what it gives to you might be actually different from, you know, what a real browser would do. Things like cursor events, you know, touch events, all different kind of quirks of just dumb compared to the quirks in a real browser. Yeah. So one question that I have that's kind of along those same lines is when you're writing component tests, is it the same as if you're writing end-to-ends where you can actually open up a browser window and see your component and debug it? Because that's, I mean, that's one of the most helpful things about Cypress is that I can actually see what's happening. It doesn't have to run headless. And that's one of the most frustrating things about React testing libraries that prints out this awful HTML oh, yeah, yeah. in the yeah. console and you have to try and figure out what's missing or what's different. <laughs> or yeah, or why yeah. couldn't it find my component? Like, you know, why right. couldn't it find it? It looks like it's right there. Because <laughs> yeah. with Cypress, the other thing too is the recordings sometimes. Because mm. for people that don't know, Cypress will basically record what it's doing in the browser. And sometimes that can be absolutely invaluable for debugging because sometimes you're like, why can't it find it? And then you look at the recording and you say like, oh, because the button's not there. Well, wait, <laughs> crap, what what went wrong that it's not there, right? Whereas yeah. if you're looking at, as Paige said, if you're looking at just some DOM dump, sometimes that stuff is way harder to, to track down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. So Cypress, when it runs component test, opens the real browser, just like end-to-end test. You see it. You see the actual test on the left and the commands. You see the actual component running in the real browser. You can open DevTools. You can install React DevTools. And I think even for React, it actually comes built in already with Cypress component testing. So you can find the components and so on. Now, the only thing that where you have to install anything extra, like as a plugin or like my code, is that if you want, for example, to access the internals of your component in React, right? Like you want to, for example, change the state. Now, those are implementation details. And in reality, even if you write React Cypress components, you shouldn't do that, right? You should think of your component as a black box. You interact with that component. It's on a page like a real user, right? Like, for example, you can click on... Or like mount your date picker and see if a date is disabled because that's a prop you send. But you shouldn't kind of reach into the component state and say it has state disabled kind of property. It, mm-hmm. You shouldn't do that. It ties your task too much to implementation details. But but you could. But you you see your component. You can inspect the DOM elements. You can see the network calls. You can stop and spy on them as well from your task, right? But it, it, it's a huge advantage. Because you see what's going on. You can not only see a video of your test run or screenshot, but you have time travel and debugger where you can see how your component looked at each step of your component test. You can just like hover over the step. Yeah, it, it sounds to me a little bit like, to, to keep comparing it to other things that are out there, a little bit like Storybook, but it, they're like actual automated tests. Because I think a lot of people use Storybook for here's my component, here's like the 10 ways you can use it. But that's not automated that like, if you're actually using it for like QA or testing purposes, you have to send someone in there and who's physically (laughs) clicking the things and (laughs) ensuring it. Whereas this is like recognizing different component testing scenarios and just like automating that they do what they're supposed to do. You're absolutely right. And speaking of storybook, about a year, we actually started like adding commands to the stories, I believe, where you can mount a component and then like click on a button, right? So we're kind of trying to introduce this 
test concept where you interact and maybe see it, right? But compared where Cypress is with its API and test running capabilities where you can control the clock, control the network, control everything in the browser, right? It's like one twentieth, right? Yeah. Storybook is really optimized to like be almost like a catalog or an atlas of your components rather than like I'm going to functionally yeah. exercise my component and make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Rather than right. this is how it looks, this is how you know all the props are. Yeah. So one question that I had for the component testing is how does it stack up in terms of the amount of time it takes to run the tests? Because that's one of the the things that was nice about Jest is that it it is so fast with running unit tests and integration tests and end-to-end tests traditionally just take longer because it's interacting with a real DOM. So how yeah. does how do the component tests do in terms of time? The end-to-end tests are slower than unit sure. tests, right? That's by default, right? You open a real browser and it actually runs at the speed of your website, mm-hmm. right? That's for end-to-end tests. The web components, once the browser is open, run as fast as just test. Even, because I understand... It's a real browser, real APIs are involved, right? But the component tests, they're mounted very differently, right? They don't reset everything like end-to-end tests in Cypress. They can share the same like browser window. So they run extremely fast. And every time you change something in your source code or your spec files, because it's the same bundle, Cypress reruns everything affected. And it, it, they're flying, to be honest, right? <laughs> but, but it's only the initial like open browser right? Let's say 10, 20 seconds on your machine. That's the slow part. Mm -hmm. After that, but that's the super fast. And to me, this initial penalty for opening a browser, you only pay it once. Imagine you come to work, right? You start your VS Code. Like, you don't close your VS Code after you work with a file and then, okay, I need to open that file, close it, (laughs) restart it, right? But no. So the same thing with Cypress. You keep your VS Code open while you're editing the code, and you keep Cypress just running on another screen, watching your files, right? Never like It never has to reopen the windows, right? So you don't pay that penalty for each test. And on CI, this initial kind of penalty for starting the Cypress run, I guess, 10, 15 seconds, but it's CI. Right, mm-hmm. it probably takes longer for you to install the dependencies, check out code, right, prepare the Docker image, right, mm-hmm. actually start your application if you want to run end-to-end tests. So to me, the component tests are pretty much the same speed as just test, right? But they do the real thing, which is yeah. nice. So what is the status of the feature then right now? Is this like I should be using this in my production apps immediately? Is it I should be just sort of toying around with it, seeing if it's a good fit for me? Uh, where is all that at? I always said it, it was ready from day one. Four years ago, when I released it as like a, a plugin for Cypress, right? Uh, something you install separately, you, you could use it, right? And use it successfully. You don't use it in production. That's the big thing, right? You use it as a dev dependency. Right. So, yeah, right? If it doesn't work, you just don't use it, right? Or you don't write the test. If a test like locks up, right? Or doesn't do the same thing, you just skip it mm-hmm. and you file a bug with Cypress. And if you can in- create a reproducible example, right? Then the, the Cypress team will definitely like fix it right away for you. Yeah. Other people, and I've done it myself a long time ago, but other people now like took all the React examples from testing library, you know, can see that books and courses, you know, and so on. And they recreated them one to one. So my friend Murat Oskan, he is preparing to release it. Where, I mean, the repo is public already, where he has hundreds of test examples in React testing like, and so on, you know, and equivalent Cypress component test, right? Nice. They all do the same thing. You know, they are much shorter because the API is, is, right, is simpler. They all work, right? I don't see any major issues, right? The only thing that is, I would say, is kind of complicated right now and just gives you by default is code coverage, right? And stopping the imports. So Mm -hmm. by default, just has a thing where you can instrument your code with counters and at the end of a test run can say, this line in your source file in your component was a test run 10 times. This one five, but this one never was executed. So you probably should add a a test to cover this. Right. So in Cypress is possible. In my course, I, I you know I show how to do it. You ins- add one more bubble, you know, Istanbul plugin, and when Cypress has a code coverage plugin, it generates the reports. 
So it's possible, but it's something you have to add. And Jess has it out of a box. And Jess is also running where, because it loads everything, it can stop your import. So when you write a component test, you can say, well, this component is loading this other component, but I don't want to use it. So why don't you substitute this mock function, Mm -hmm. right? So Cypress has it, but you have to actually, you know, kind of write Webpack yourself. I, I do have examples, but I wish those two things were simpler, okay? Yeah. Now, the advantage with Cypress is that if you can configure, for example, code coverage for your components, you can also configure it for end-to-end, and Cypress plugin will combine it for you, and you'll just hit your numbers like right away because end-to-end tests are so efficient mm-hmm. at covering majority of your code, even with simple tests, right? So it will be very efficient more than. But those two things are the only thing where, like, I'm kind of say they're nice to have, mm-hmm. but even without them, it's fine to use. Yeah. Do uh, do people tend to then if you if you fully buy into this approach like you you drank the Cypress Kool Aid you're you're going all in <laughs> would you have like one test suite that did it all like run your end to end tests and run your component tests maybe you'd like block it up so like maybe during the development you could run like isolated components but your like CI server would just presumably run them all at once right because they're all just right. Cypress test, test uh, Cypress tests at the end of the day right yeah so. Here's my approach, and you can you know disagree, but I would keep all your tests in the same repository with your code, first of all. Mm-hmm. Now, Cypress would keep the end-to-end test by default in like Cypress slash E2E folder. So they're a little bit separate from your source code, but usually is in source subfolder. Right. Yeah. The component test they advocate is to put right next to your source code. So in your source folder, you would have like date picker dot, I don't know, TSX, let's say. And you would have datepicker.sci.tsx that has component tests for this. So you, you have it all together. Now, let's say you open a pull request. Your CI should run all the tests. Like, I, I'm a strong advocate. Run all the tests. You probably want to run component tests first because they're faster, right? You don't have to even bundle or start application. So if your Cypress component test fast, then the second command would say run or like start your application locally run end-to-end test against it, right? And then if both pass, then you have high confidence that you can merge this pull request and so on. But yeah, run them all. Run them all the time. But let the CI do it. Like, don't run all the tests. Like, it, it's so easy to write a lot of end-to-end tests, but they take five, 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour. Don't do it yourself, right? That's what CI machines are for, <laughs> right? Spin up 10 machines, let you know use Cypress parallelization or whatever else tools to split it up across all the end-to-end test spec, and let your CI do the, like the boring work of like going through all the end-to-end tests for you. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think your your advice is great, and I think that's a structure that a lot of people are using today. I know Paige and I have a structure that's similar to that. I think I think the one big difference though is that today, lots of times those code those approaches are written using two different tech stacks, right? So I have my Cypress or my end-to-end tests or whatever. And then I have my like either unit tests or component tests or whatever that's used, that's written using completely separate tools. So I think one big advantage that I haven't been giving enough thought up until now is that if you're consolidating on one set of APIs, that just makes your, I don't know, the amount of like mind shift you have to do between the two, there's like one less thing to learn, right? Because Someone like I, I'm a very casual React developer overall. And when I jump into these environments, I'm always like, oh, God, how did I, how do I select an element in React testing yeah. library? And then I go to write the end to end test. And it's like, oh, man, now I have to figure out how to select a button in this thing. <laughs> and so I'm back to like the same stack overflow posts. And I, I feel like doing them once just the fewer moving pieces and dependencies you can have in your apps, usually the happier you are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This is a huge, <laughs> hu- this is absolutely incredible bonus point, right? It's a single stack, right? So all the tests for code that's meant to run in the browser can be written using one tool, mm-hmm. right? Cypress. If you have code that's meant to run in Node, well, Cypress doesn't run in Node, okay? That's the only place where you probably will have to bring another technology stack, right? Maybe Ava, Mocha, Jest, right? You name it. Now, Node has a built-in test library, right? Or test runner, right? Like with Node 17, they have their own assort and the test runner. So you don't even have to bring a separate tool for your Node code, right? But Cypress can easily take over entire front-end testing. And one more thing that, you know, I always use, 
Cypress can run API tests for you, right? So usually people bring one more tool to, for example, hit the REST API endpoint, right? Kind of confirm the server is doing maybe yeah. GraphQL endpoints. Cypress can do that for you, right? It has side request command that can execute any kind of HTTP call. You can check the results. And I have a plugin called SciAPI that actually takes both calls, like requests and responses, and puts it right in a browser. So you see what's happening, right? So you can actually visually see each step of your test and what the server returned. Mm -hmm. So if you do API testing, you can use Cypress as well and cover the whole gamut of testing. Man, Cypress is the one tool for everything, apparently. (laughs) Hey, that's why uh, Tolkien called it one tool to rule them all. (laughs) Am I paraphrasing? I forgot how exact quote goes. He he was famously a Cypress fan, so I I think it makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) He loved trees, so he might. He did. So, so what would you what kind of advice would you give to people who are interested in getting started either with Cypress end to ends or components? Is there one that you would recommend they start with? Or are there any strategies that you have for component testing, like going from small to large or vice versa? For anyone just starting and like trying to see what the Cypress thing is about, look at Cypress documentation. They have very nice introduction and and examples, right? I would say start with end-to-end tests because you you don't need to know anything about the website to actually write end-to-end tests. You just need to say, okay, I want to test this URL. I I didn't deploy it. I don't know how it's written, but I just want to visit this, I don't know, to do mvc.acma.co, right? And you can write the first Cypress you know, test, but just says site visit, you know, to do mvc.acma.co. And that's it. And see how it runs. So you don't need to know anything about the application if you if you want to learn about component testing, then well, in that case, you actually need the component source code, right? And you can use Cypress examples as a starting point. But you probably are interested more at your own companies or your own open source projects source code, so that you can start Cypress there. And I would say if you're already using Cypress on your project, that's the sweet spot, right? If you already have end to end tests and you know how they run, you can say, okay, now let me configure component testing point at whatever framework I'm using locally. And now let me write a test that mounts a date picker and and now tries to test it. So start with end-to-end and then kind of go down the pyramid to component testing and maybe like unit API testing. Got it. Well, Glad, this has been awesome. Are there any things Cypress related that we have not touched on? Like any... Any tips you want to give people? Any other any other features or any topics that that we've missed <laughs> that you want to drop? No, but in, in the peaks, uh, it's funny how you said any Cypress tips. So I have a website called Cypress.tips where I just post, you know, oh. all everything I do. Right, <laughs> Cypress.tips. If you want to find my tips, that's um, an amazing I, URL. <laughs> <laughs> that, that domain, I mean, I, I love a lot of, lots of testing tools, right? So just in case, I also got playwright that tips just to see how this thing turns out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so it's, you know, look at those uh, unusual top level domains. You can find lots of interesting things. Like, um, I did find gleb.dev. That's my top domain that redirects to my website. So it's, it's, it's available. Very cool. Hey folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show or, If you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production, and you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. Well, why don't we move on to our picks? So we picked something from either around the tech world, music, TV, something around our lives. And Paige, do you want to kick us off today? Sure. So I will keep the kitchen utensils and kitchen tools train rolling since we seem to have at least one of those every week during picks. <laughs> My pick this week is going to be a three pack of kitchen tongs that you can get on Amazon for <laughs> very inexpensively. The nice thing about them, though, is that it comes in three different sizes. So when you've got, you know, your big steak that's on the grill or you've got a small potato that you need to turn over in the oven or whatever, there is a tong that is the right size. And you know, you can use all three at the same time if you want to. So that's going to be my my pick for this week. <laughs> I love it. Longtime listeners of the show are going to have like a full kitchen set up by the time we're done with this. Yeah. I know. Uh, 
so I'll keep the the sort of at least food thing related going uh, theme going. I'm going to pick HelloFresh, which is one of the many like meal delivery services. I, I might have picked it before a few years ago, but we've been using it for a long time now. And it's it's the it, there's a lot of these concepts out there. It's but basically they ship you food every week. And I think I'll pick them because their their app has gotten quite good that you now have a lot of choices for meals. They make it easy. Like if you're going to be gone or just don't want food for a few weeks, it's easy to pause it. It's easy to add extra meals. They've done a lot in terms of improving uh, the process. So it feels pretty slick to use and food's pretty good. I like it because I like to cook, but I hate to shop for like individual <laughs> ingredients or like buy a thing of some spice that I'm only going to use for one thing ever. Then it's going to sit in my cabinet for years. Um, so HelloFresh is really good for that. So if you've ever thought about one of those services, it's pretty good. Nice. I've tried those in the past and I really like that they give you recipes because they it makes me try things that I would never have thought of or found on my own. Yep. And also makes our kids try things that they would have never tried on their own. That's a nice, it's either a benefit or a, or a curse, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Gleb, what picks do you have for us? Well, for a, a, anyone who wants to try Cypress, uh, learn about it, cypress.tip slash courses. I have a free course about Cypress 10, covers React end-to-end and component testing. I also will do a workshop that's free. You're encouraged to donate. It's hosted by Sauce Labs. It's called Testing for Good. Right, we'll put the link in the show notes. And all proceeds from donations are going to a climate organization. As you probably know, we broke the planet's climate by emitting so many so much greenhouse gases that is actually affecting the temperature and hurricanes and droughts and wildfires. So my last pick is an organization called free fifty dot org. And free fifty is the safe number of parts per million of you know carbon dioxide. Right now we're at four twenty approximately, and it keeps increasing. So the 350 has been very effective at, you know, trying to maybe stop the climate change and reverse it. So I encourage everyone to find your local chapter, join it locally, and, you know, act together to maybe make the climate crisis slightly less scary. Awesome. Nice. Could you spell that for me just so, or for our listeners? Because I'm trying to Google in the background and I, I couldn't find the, the right domain. It's free fifty, like the numbers three five zero dot org, o r g. They they use the number, which is which is another you know kind of tip. If you need a domain, just get a <laughs> number. Uh, numbers. I, I totally was like I couldn't find it because I didn't use a number. But man, yeah. people aren't going to need the show notes because all the URLs you're dropping are like <laughs> it tops like seven <laughs> characters. <laughs> it's it's so difficult to you know like. As a developer, you have to have at least 10, 20 domain names that you're not <laughs> using, but you just like thought it would be a great idea. Yeah. So sometimes you, you know, you, you find excellent names. Awesome stuff. Clip. this, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, my last question for you, if people want to follow you or keep, is there like a good social place? Uh, where would, where should people check you out? Absolutely. So it's, um, my last name, Bakhmutov, uh, B-A-H-M-U-T-O-V. I have Twitter handle, it's LinkedIn, it's GitHub profile. I would say it's easier probably to remember gleb.dev, G-L-E-B.dev domain. That will have links to all my social. But perfect. tweet at me and I'll tweet back. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Well, this has been awesome. I learned a ton about Cypress and Cypress component testing, so hopefully other people have as well. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Paige and TJ. Thank you for listening. Cool. All right, everybody. Until next week. See you then. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.